somewhere in the great beyond, separated from you by either distance, space, time, or something else, there's a world out there. And though you've likely never walked its many trails or looked upon its open skies, this world to you is as real as any other. You know what it's like to grab the only seat that doesn't wobble at your favorite noodle joint right before the evening rush, to feel the wet of the rain getting to soak through your jacket and chill your skin. Overhead, the chatter of advertisements are as ceaseless as ever, and the spotlights are competing with the beaming neon, but in this moment at least, you can almost tune them out. You know the history of this place. You can name its ancient kings and recite their many deeds, both great and terrible. To others, a mass of broken stone is but a ruin, a momentary curiosity to break up the monotony of the trail, but to you it is a symbol. You know the story of the men that built it, how long ago it kept watch over a kingdom that was very different from the one you walk today, a forgotten time of ancient powers and forbidden lore. You are exhilarated in this place. It presents to you boundless opportunities for adventure, wonder, and terror. There is a galaxy of stories waiting for you, a chance to shed your old career and become a bounty hunter working a mark along the outer rim, or a freedom fighter in some backwater jungle. There are heroes in this place, legends whose courage and sacrifices will echo in eternity, and you can be one of them. You have friends here, of every kind and every character, and you have shared with them those silent moments in the last seconds before a drop. You know how to motivate them, when to listen, when to give them space, and when to push them further than any of you ever thought possible. And when you return, when you drink to your success or failure, it is always together. You will recount your favorite moments, boast of courageous deeds, and toast to both the living and those who remain only in your memories. Glorious wars and senseless carnage have bathed this place in blood and bone. And when the dust settles, it is difficult to know if the cause of the victor was any more righteous than that of the defeated. When you study the great campaigns of this place, you can't help but marvel at the tactics, the strategy, the bravery of men and women who laid down their lives against foes that reality itself rejected as obscene. And you wonder at what might have been if a single outcome had been just a little different. This place has dangerous secrets, and you seek them out. Your mind walks the darkened trails that others fear, and you read the words that most deny. You see the patterns and coincidence, not a swirling mass of chaos, but one great game whose fallen king might yet prevail. You hear the theories and the rumors of returning sons and ancient adversaries, and you accept that to study the abyss is to let the abyss study you, and that whatever happens, the galaxy is a big place, and you will not be missed. But most of all, you have a sense of longing, a desire to escape whatever life you live today and find another in this place. You want to discover what qualities it might recognize in you, what role you're destined to fulfill. You want this world to test you, to push you to your limits, and reveal who you truly are. Yet you'd be satisfied with whatever life you might find, whether you're selected to sit in the big chair or merely hang out at the bar. So long as you're here, in this place, this world, you'd be content to just exist. You feel all these things and so much more, and the longer you think about it, the deeper you invest yourself in this place, the more you realize that it kind of sucks and you could probably come up with something way better. Or maybe you've phrased it differently than that, but one way or another, you've thought about creating a world of your own, something just as immersive and detailed as the ones that have fascinated you. But how exactly does one go about world building? What questions, factors, and ideas need to be considered? And what does the world building process even look like once it's in motion? In this new series that we're calling The Way of World Building, the Templin Institute is going to discuss these questions, offer our opinions, and begin to build our own world that might serve as a case study. In each episode, we'll approach some aspect of world building, big or small, from developing the history, culture, society, and government of a vast and ancient empire, to figuring out what drinks might be served in some backwater tavern someplace. World building is huge, it covers an enormous array of topics and ideas, and as far as this series is concerned, nothing is beyond our scope. And to accompany each episode, to serve as that case study, we'll be publishing to a secondary channel some companion videos talking all about our world and the lore we've created for it. Right now though, we're still getting started, and we don't even know what kind of world it is we're building. So before we can start crafting whatever it is we're crafting, in this first episode of The Way of World Building, I think it's important that I explain my general philosophy when it comes to this aspect of creative writing. I'm going to be approaching it from a certain perspective, and that's going to shape what this series looks like. After that, we'll also briefly review the role of world building when compared to setting a narrative, 
and discuss some of the most popular methods writers use. Finally, I want to explore all the reasons why someone might choose to world build and how the warnings of world builder's disease that inevitably arise when this topic is discussed might not always be appropriate. To do any of that though, it needs to be emphasized again right out of the gate that this series won't always be impartial or neutral. I have some strong opinions and ideas on how world building should and should not be done, but I don't want that to interfere with something else I believe. World building is a deeply creative exercise and I think the process is going to look different for everyone. Because of that, I don't think there's a wrong way to approach it. Writing is hard and creative writing can be a long demoralizing struggle. So if you've found some method of pushing through that, if you're building your world using method X when everyone else is using method Y, who cares? Whatever makes sense for you is the right way of doing it. The way of world building, therefore, is not intended to be some definitive guide. There is no shortage of people eager to tell you that what you're doing is wrong or that you've made some critical mistake, myself among them. But I don't believe it's possible for anyone to make some objective, all-encompassing, standard operating procedure that everyone can find success with. So this is not a series on how to world build. This is a series on how I world build. Build worlds, whatever sounds better. I can provide my thoughts, give advice, and show you my own process, and I can be adamant in this, but it would be insane to believe that the things I consider most important and the process I use is going to be the best approach every time in every single project involving world building. Instead, my hope is that by following along and seeing how I get started, approach certain challenges, and integrate various elements, you can get a sense of my method and use it to inform your own. If we're closely aligned on how we approach world building, you might be able to directly reference this series in your own work. If we're completely unaligned and you disagree with me on everything, then I think this series might be even more useful. Being presented with what to you might appear as the wrong way of doing things can help further an understanding of why your own method is the right one for you. In either case, when you're watching this series, incorporate what you find useful into your own method and ditch the rest. And don't rely on this series in isolation. Put it alongside any other guides or sources of inspiration you found, and come up with your own way of world building. Now with all that said, this series is also kind of a reaction to something I hear again and again whenever world building is discussed. Something that I really disagree with because it doesn't reflect at all my own experiences. But before we can get into all that, we need to first take a bit of a step back and look at the basic components of world building and story. Better yet, before we do that, let's ask ourselves, what is a story? Oh my God in heaven. Just as everyone approaches this whole concept a bit differently, it also seems like everyone defines it a bit differently. But my personal interpretation vaguely resembles something like this. If we think of storytelling as a pyramid, world building makes up the base. This is the foundation of the universe, whether that's a single region, a continent, a whole planet, a star system, an entire galaxy, or however far that reality extends. In addition to this geography, whatever form that may take, this foundation also encompasses the history of the world, its cultures, religions, nations, and factions, and every other aspect, all the way down to how fuzzy the fur is on some alien caterpillar. The world-building foundation of the pyramid provides the broader context and framework for our next two levels. Right above world-building, there's the setting. And this is the specific part or parts of your world that the story takes place within. The broadest definition of a setting is an environment where something is located, the place at which something happens. Author Robert McKee describes a setting as needing a distinct period, location, conflict, and duration. And the only reason I know that is because Tail Foundry has covered this subject extensively. If you'd like a deeper dive into the relationship between story, setting, and world building, I'd recommend you check them out. I mean, they use different metaphors over there, but it's all the same principles. But back to my pyramid, right at the top we have our narrative. Whatever plot or story that weaves through the setting which is itself a part of the greater world. If our world building consists of an entire galaxy far, far away, our setting might be the planet Hoth under attack by the Galactic Empire, and then our narrative would be Luke Skywalker trying to cover the evacuation of the Rebel Alliance. But we also can't forget that no metaphor is ever really perfect. The lines between these levels are not always obvious, or at least not always obvious to me. But I like the pyramid analogy because I think it illustrates how little of the world or even its setting will be present in the actual narrative. How much of the galaxy did we actually see over the course of The Empire Strikes Back? Maybe not as much as you think. And I also like the pyramid metaphor because I think it makes for an easy way to show how different people go about world building. Although to do this we need to flip it upside down. Like I said, no metaphor is ever perfect. 
some people like to take a bird's eye view to world building. They look at the big picture when developing their world, and only once it's fully realized do they actually set about telling a story within it. There's a race of people called the Elves, and this is their mythology, and their history, and their language, and their culture. These are the dwarves, and men, and hobbits, and here are the same exhaustive details for all of them. And only now that I have figured this entire world out, can I finally tell my story about one of those hobbits throwing a ring into a volcano. On the opposite side of things, we have those that start from ground level, so to speak. They write their story and figure out setting and world building as it comes up. There's a group of children from a noble family who just found a litter of dire wolves alone in the snow. Okay, now we gotta figure out what noble family they're from, the Starks. And what kingdom do they rule, Winterfell and the North. And that kingdom is actually one of seven kingdoms subservient to the royal house of Baratheon and King's Landing who usurped the Targaryens, and on and on it goes as the story progresses. George R. R. Martin describes authors who follow these two methods as architects and gardeners. Architects build the world first, while gardeners plant seeds and help them grow over the course of the narrative. But I think these are really just two examples on either end of a spectrum, and probably not representative of how most people actually go about world building. Is anyone really 100% gardener or 100% architect? Between these two approaches we have every other variation, starting from the middle and working outwards in both directions, or maybe swinging between one approach and the other, depending on how you feel and what makes sense to you. And your approach might change day to day. Again, as far as I'm concerned, if you know what you're trying to achieve, there's no wrong answers in how you get there. And I've wanted to emphasize that last point pretty consistently, because I think the discussion surrounding world building, or at least the aspect of that discussion happening here on YouTube, has maybe lost its perspective a bit. Like I said, world building at its core is a creative exercise, and that process is going to look different for everyone, in minor or major ways. So when advice is increasingly presented in the form of, here's five world building mistakes to avoid, I think that's coming from a fundamentally flawed understanding of what world building actually is. Here's an example. In our own world, rivers flow downhill. Hopefully that didn't shock anybody. They typically start in mountains and flow into lakes or oceans. For a river to behave contrary to this is one of the most oft-cited examples of a so-called mistake. But good world building isn't just making sure your rivers always start in the mountains and empty into oceans. Good world building is understanding how rivers work in our world and then letting that inform how they function in your own, even if you decide to throw out real world logic entirely. A river that conforms perfectly to our understanding of the natural world, and a river of magic that flows up mountains intermingling with the light of distant stars, can both be effective examples of world building, provided they were crafted with intention and are consistent within the world. But when these hard declarations are made, your river starts in a valley, this is a mistake, it can have the effect of stifling the creative process before it even begins. Now I'm sure most people understand this distinction, but it's helpful to explicitly state it every now and then. In a creative process where there's no firm rules, it's easier to fall into the trap of conflating your own way with the right way and imposing it on everyone else. Some of my favorite examples of world building, the universes I think that are truly exceptional, are the ones that broaden my understanding of what's even possible. They're also the ones where if I had been presented with the initial outline, having no idea what the finished world would look like, I probably would have been very critical and pointed out a bunch of mistakes. Thank God they didn't listen to me. But what I see repeated most often on YouTube when different approaches to world building are discussed is also what I kind of disagree with the most, and it's always expressed the exact same way. Watch out for world builder's disease. World Builder's Disease is described as a debilitating condition in which someone becomes so invested in the creation of the minute details of their world that they forget or never get around to actually writing their story. They waste all their time working out the biology of that alien caterpillar or coming up with a kingdom's history until it spans millennia, while their characters in the actual narrative remain underdeveloped. If you're approaching world building with this mindset, that you should constantly be wary of dedicating too much time to it, I think it would be easy to look at my pyramid from earlier and whether intentionally or unintentionally interpret it as a hierarchy. The narrative is the most important, followed by setting, leaving world building as the least important element of storytelling. And if you work on it too much, you'll catch a disease. Author Brandon Sanderson says this explicitly. Your time is best spent learning how to make engaging and interesting characters, followed by learning how to tell a really good plot with, in third place, your ability to have a really great setting. I don't know if I agree on that, and yet this viewpoint, on YouTube at least, 
seems to dominate most videos and conversations surrounding world building. And at times, this can feel a bit hypocritical. With these same people praising the world building of Middle Earth as the pinnacle of what's possible, but then going on to dismiss much of the process that led to its creation. As much as J.R.R. Tolkien was concerned with telling stories, he hardly seemed afraid of spending an inordinate amount of time on details that existed outside the main narratives. I can't imagine him being too concerned with the idea that he was spending too much time working on world building versus story. But you know what? Most of the time, the world builder's disease mindset is the right one. Not many of us can be like Tolkien and spend a couple decades coming up with histories and languages and then turn those into one of the greatest fantasy series ever written. And to be fair to Mr. Sanderson, I assume in that clip he was addressing a writing class, probably full of aspiring novelists to whom that advice was entirely appropriate. If your objective is to finish a novel or a screenplay or whatever, so you can meet some sort of deadline, yeah, world builder's disease can be fatal. However, I think it can be an equally fatal mistake to arrive at the conclusion that world building must always be a secondary or tertiary consideration. Great world building might elevate even a mediocre story, while mediocre world building can drag down even a great narrative. I like to think there's a delicate balance between narrative, setting, and world building. Maybe instead of a pyramid, we should be thinking in terms of the donut, three equal sections supporting and influencing one another. Donuts. Is there anything they can't do? But perhaps the worst thing the world builder's disease mindset does is reinforce the idea that world building only has a singular purpose. But this warning is coming from a place of implicit bias. It contends that if you're world building, it's because you're writing a narrative, and every moment spent world building comes at the expense of that narrative. Warnings of world builder's disease often fail to acknowledge or only make a passing reference to the idea that there are a multitude of other reasons why people might want to engage in this creative exercise, in any of which the narrative might be secondary to the world building or maybe not present at all. Tabletop role-playing games are maybe the most popular example. In the last few decades, Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, Call of Cthulhu, and many other systems have broken out of nerd culture and entered the mainstream creating a whole new generation of game masters, dungeon masters, I don't know what the right term is, the people who hide behind the divider thing and roll the dice. These people will undoubtedly become intimately familiar with the exercise of world building, whether guiding players through established scenarios or creating their own homebrew campaigns. A compelling narrative is still important, but it's usually the result of a collaborative process. Many dungeon masters might have very limited control over the story and actions of the player characters. And we've also seen the rise of the cinematic universe. Multiple franchises are now built on this concept, in which interconnected storylines and a cohesive world extend beyond traditional storytelling mediums. In some cases, world building is now handled by a dedicated team, with individual directors and writers now sharing responsibility for the overarching world and its continuity. As the concept of these shared universes becomes more and more popular, it doesn't seem crazy to suggest that some people might enjoy the world building of a franchise first and foremost. Talk to fans of Warhammer 40,000, and I think the majority would tell you that they enjoy the universe more than any individual story within it. And I think you'll find people who feel the same way about Star Wars, Harry Potter, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and so on. And let's not discount the world building projects that don't have any written narrative at all. Many artists set their work within a shared universe, leaving it up to their audience to imagine the context behind it all. In these examples and others, advice like the kind Brandon Sanderson gives, intended for a class full of novelists, is maybe not always entirely relevant. And then there's the poor wayward souls like me. I can't write a story worth a damn, I've never been too interested in the hero's journey, the Dan Harmon story circle, or whatever methods people use to craft their narratives. Maybe one day that will change, but for now though, it's not for me. But I love world building. I think it can be an enormously fulfilling and creative exercise in which you can take your favorite elements from popular culture, combine them with real world history and your own life experiences, and in the process gain a better appreciation and understanding for all the intricate details that shape both our world and alternate ones. And it also just happens to be a fun way to kill some time. And if one day whatever I've come up with forms the basis of an interesting narrative told by me or someone else, great. But that's not my primary motive, that's not why I'm doing this. So in my case, what good are warnings about world builder's disease? I'm basically typhoid Mary. But there's one last grave oversight I think people make when discussing world building. And that's not acknowledging that world building encompasses an enormous number of interlocking subjects and fields of study, very few of which are traditionally associated with the craft of writing. 
While being a skilled writer is certainly necessary in conveying the world you've created, the art of world building goes well beyond mere storytelling. To create a hyper-realistic and immersive universe, you might need to delve into the study of anthropology, history, geography, sociology, through to scientific fields like physics, biology, and astronomy. And while a few brilliant people out there can effortlessly incorporate all these things into their narrative, being a great writer does not automatically make you a great world builder. And as things like tabletop homebrew settings and shared universes become more popular and grow in complexity, couldn't world builder's disease go from something to be avoided at all costs and become a desirable quality in a dungeon master or a writing partner or whatever? And that brings us all the way back to what I hope to accomplish with the way of world building. I can't tell you how to write your story or the most effective ways to incorporate world building into it. That's not really my area. But as someone whose consciousness has been forced into investigating alternate worlds for all eternity, I think I've gotten pretty good at articulating why certain ones can resonate with us so strongly and why others might feel bland and passionless. I won't claim to be an expert on narratives, but I think I know world building. And the most interesting way to explain what makes it good or bad, it seems to me, is in trying to create a world of our own and describe every part of that process along the way. So that's where I stand on this whole exercise, and that's what my approach with this series is going to be. If you are brand new to world building, simply getting started can sometimes be the hardest part. My hope is that by following this series, it might help you break through that initial roadblock. And if you're already an expert world builder with your own methods, I think it can be equally useful to see how someone else approaches the same problems. In the next video in this series, we'll be covering genre. There's a few particularly associated with deep world building, and each brings with it its own expectations and baggage. People also love arguing about subgenres, high fantasy versus low fantasy, hard sci-fi versus soft sci-fi, and I have my own opinions, so all that will be in episode 2. So until then, good luck and good world building.